Back New York. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ninth session of the Black Anglicans Anti Black R Racism. And tonight begins our new series, Anti Black and Anti Indigenous Racism Shared Pathways Series. Before we do that, however, we're going to acknowledge that the land that we're on is the land of the original people. So please let us acknowledge. Today we honor and acknowledge that this land and locality in which we live, move and breathe, is the historical and traditional lands of the indigenous people of what we call Turtle Island, and is what is commonly called North America. As we journey together, may we seek the path of justice, reconciliation, and renewal. May we commit ourselves to be partners in healing and peace, to the glory and thanksgiving. And the Black Anakins of Canada Declaration. We as people of African descent are commissioned and called to be ambassadors of reconciliation. We're called to create opportunities and space for courage building, healing, fellowship, and empowerment. This special calling is both a reminder and a challenge to ourselves and to the whole church that we are no longer destined to just obey, suffer, and witness, but to disrupt, heal, and lead. Our vision, we envision the Anglican Church of Canada as a faith community that values and respects the rich diversity of Black people who are empowered to enjoy equitable participation, representation, and a sense of belongingness, inclusion in the mission of Jesus Christ in the full life of the Anglican Church. Our mission is to increase the participation, representation, and empowerment, belongingness of Black people in lay and ordained leadership roles in the full life of the Anglican Church of Canada, and to develop partnerships with Black communities, other racialized groups, and oppressed peoples. And now I'm going to go to the bios of our two guest speakers tonight. So, one moment. First, I'm going to the, the most reverend Mark McDonald, Archbishop of the National Indigenous Church. So the Most Reverend Mark Dalton became the Anglican Church of Canada's first <laughs> national indigenous Anglican bishop in 2007. After serving as bishop of the U.S. Episcopal Diocese of Alaska for 10 years, in 2019, now Archbishop McDonald was elevated to Archbishop. This was a homecoming of sorts for Archbishop McDonald, who had attended Wycliffe College and served as a priest in Mississauga, Ontario. Archbishop MacDonald was born on January the 15th, 1954, the son of Blake and Sue Nell MacDonald. He holds a BA in Religious Studies and Psychology from the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota, an MA in Divinity from Wycliffe College, and they postgraduate work at Lutheran Northwestern Theological Seminary in Minneapolis. He has had a long and varied ministry, holding positions in Mississauga, Ontario, Duluth, Minnesota, Toma, Wisconsin, Boston, Wisconsin, Portland, Oregon, and a Southeast region mission of the Diocese of Navajo Land. Immediately prior to his ordination to the Episcopate, Archbishop McDonald was canon missioner for training in the Diocese of Minnesota and vicar of St. Antipas Church, Red Lake, Minnesota, and St. John in the Wilderness Church, Red Lake, Red Lake Nation, Minnesota. Archbishop McDonald and his wife, Virginia, have three children. And our second speaker is Reverend Evan Smith, Reverend Evan Smith. Evan is ordained in the United Church of Canada and is the minister at Toronto Native Urban Ministry in Regent Park. Reverend Evan is two straight, 
Anishinaabe, and Turtle Clan. Evan works on the front lines doing pastoral care and harm reduction with sex workers, indigenous LGBTQ2A youth, families, people who are incarcerated, and street involved folks. Passionate about encouraging people's spiritual health, Evan serves indigenous peoples living on the margins through the practice of both traditional spirituality and Christianity as part of her ministerial work at Toronto Urban Ministry, Native Ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to introduce Archbishop Mark McDonald. Migrit, thank you. Migrit. 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 I greet you as relatives. Uh, I said in, in uh, Anishinaabe, Moen, uh, uh, we are all relatives and I'm very happy to be here. I think that uh, I would say just to, to frame this, uh, uh, Martin Luther King pointed out that uh, uh, reconciliation does not happen because a, an oppressor wakes up one morning and says, you know, I've been pretty mean and I've got to change everything. Um, these aren't Martin Luther King's exact words, but yeah, what he pointed out was that uh, the, the, the um, uh, um, reconciliation, indeed liberation, was the reality of an oppressed people reclaiming their humanity. And we are in the midst of, of, of a long period of that, and uh, I want to say that because uh, this is something that cannot be stopped. And it is, in my uh, opinion, the, the work of God. So uh, I, I want to acknowledge uh, at the beginning the uh, symbiotic relationship between uh, uh, indigenous self-determination um, at uh, m many levels, including the church, and the uh, movement of uh, African American and Afro, Afro Canadian uh, civil rights. My mentors uh, uh, were were all uh, inspired and energized by the uh, civil rights discussions of the uh, late fifties and early sixties. The um, uh, Red Power Movement, the Indigenous Rights Movement that uh, grew, up, grew up in the, the 60s, was uh, a, 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 an, an awakening of Indigenous people uh, to their own oppression uh, through the uh, uh, energizing and, and uh, uh, igniting of the um, uh, uh, civil rights movement uh, of the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and on. And that, that's, a, that's a critical factor I want to acknowledge. On a personal level, um, I, along with a number of other friends who were uh, uh, anti-war uh, draft resistors, um, became very interested in uh, Christian faith. And we went around to a whole bunch of churches and none of them would have anything to do with us. Uh, we were kind of naive and uh, we went to a lot of white evangelical churches and uh, they, they were uh, not as conservative as they are today, but they, they were pretty conservative. Uh, where we found our home was in uh, Calvary Baptist Church, a, a church of the National Baptist Convention. And uh, um, it was uh, uh, a small, uh, African-American congregation. And I, I say this uh, because I, I'm talking about this symbiotic relationship. I would not be in, uh, I would not be a uh, clergy today if, uh, if it hadn't been for that pastor. Uh, he saw in me something I certainly didn't see and nobody else saw either. And, uh, and, uh, and he was the one who encouraged me to enter the ministry and, men and mentored me uh, throughout that process uh, until I went to Wycliffe College. I grew up in the, uh, up in the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church in um, uh, the United States, but uh, for uh, quite a number of years, I would 
go to the uh, Episcopal Church, and then I would go to uh, uh, my mentor's church and uh, uh, listen. I, I liked the music a lot better than I liked the music at, at the church I went to. So anyway, uh, I, uh, uh, I would also say that in the moment that we are in now, um, the uh, uh, extrajudicial execution of George Floyd unveiled a, a, a whole group of systemic institutional uh, brutalities that are directed against people of color. Uh, and uh, as sad as, as, that, as that was, um, it was a, a moment of awakening for a lot of people, including a lot of indigenous people. And uh, right around that time, there were a number of other uh, incidents of, 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 of police brutalities towards indigenous people uh, that caught the attention of people. But beyond that, there, there were the, uh, uh, the, the, the many daily brutalities of poverty of policy choices that the government has made that underfunds uh, indigenous education, that underfunds, uh, that, that means that uh, there's over 120 uh, boil water advisories in indigenous communities across Canada. Um, when I visited a community, I always have to ask, is it okay to drink the water? Uh, that, should, that, should, that should not be. Uh, anyway, th these things uh, have, have been important this is an important moment. A lot more can be said about that, but I really want to uh, get to the heart of what I'm saying. In the late uh, 1980s, a group of Maori Anglicans came to Canada and the United States. At the time, we were facing a crisis in, in uh, pastoral care. We were trying to raise up indigenous leaders to uh, work in our churches and we were having a lot of trouble. Uh, the uh, invisible ceiling that is uh, invisible to those who make it, but is very visible to those it excludes, was making sure that indigenous people were not uh, uh, going forward. And we looked at them and they had hundreds and hundreds. I mean, they had more clergy than they needed. And we uh, were astonished at what it was. And uh, they and we said to them, "What, well, what is it?" And they said, uh, "It's in the treaty." We said, "What? The treaty? Um, you mean the church is in the treaty?" And they said, "No." And it took us a while to understand, but what they what they said became uh, critical for us. He said, "The treaty." says that we are human beings of worth and agency. The treaty says that we have control over our culture and our language. The treaty says we are fully human. We are people like all other peoples. And uh, this was a, an astonishment to us at first, but uh, later it became a, a realization that um, indigenous people have human rights that have been ignored, uh, not only by, uh, by the government, but by the church. And that was around the time of uh, the uh, revelations around the Indian residential schools and a number of uh, things that can only be described as genocide. Um, the church and the, and the government said clearly our goal is to make you folks disappear. And they, that, and they were the good guys. They were the, the bad guys were saying, let's kill them all. And uh, the, the good guys were saying, no, 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 we'll, we'll civilize them out of existence. And uh, um, they never imagined, and the laws, by the way, uh, um, are, 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 are stacked in this way. They never imagined that indigenous people would survive for any period of time. While this uh, revelation was going on, of course, there were all sorts of things going on in society, but also elders across the land spontaneously, beginning in the 1950s, uh, 
had uh, had this awakening and saying, uh, we must have our own church. I should say that the first indigenous priest, Henry Budd, uh, as, as early as the, the middle 1800s, had said, this is never going to go anywhere until we are in charge of our own mission. Um, what he saw happen over and over again is that uh, he would bring thousands of people into the church for confirmation and baptism. And they would say, oh, this is wonderful. And they would send in some Yahoo from England to clean it up a bit. And then they, you know, they would destroy it. And of course, they were paid twice as much as Henry Budd was. And so he realized right away that, that the, the way in which the people and the structures looked upon indigenous people as less than human and as their culture as something primitive to get rid of, uh, that this would, would never work. Around the, around the 50s and 60s, a whole bunch of elders, significantly William Winter in uh, Kingfisher Lake, uh, he, they had this vision of, 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 of indigenous clergy, uh, indigenous bishops, and, uh, and, uh, and a, a, a church that was fully anchored in, 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 in the gospel, um, fully uh, expressing the values and ideals of, of, of the Anglican church, but also um, um, something that was uh, fully uh, in, 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 in infused with in indigenous identity. And so at that time, they uh, began a movement uh, which uh, expanded. Uh, the significant moment was in 1988 when they had the first what we call sacred circle. And, uh, and then uh, uh, a number of key elements uh, came together. It is, uh, during this time, one thing that was important uh, was uh, 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 Indigenous people are often portrayed, even by indigenous people, by the way, as the hapless victims of the missionaries. Um, if you read the missionaries' uh, stuff, they complain about the indigenous people just didn't get it. Um, but <laughs> the reality was indigenous people got it real clearly. They just didn't buy a whole lot of what was being sold. They loved the gospel. They admired Jesus. Uh, they saw him as a, as a figure that was important, and they uh, created a kind of hybrid of their cosmology, their way of looking at the world, and, um, and, and the gospel. Uh, this had to be underground. It's important to understand that indigenous spirituality was outlawed by law until the 1960s, and you could go to jail for uh, promoting uh, indigenous religious ideas and spirituality. So these indigenous people had to hide it from the missionaries and from the authorities, the RCMP and others. But uh, what happened is uh, their way of thinking went underground in the hymns and in hymn singing and also in the work of catechists. Um, I wish I could say more about that, but we, we don't have time. But um, and what has happened in, in our church uh, is that uh, we have looked to these elders who courageously held on to indigenous identity, courageously believed that the word made flesh meant that the gospel would become uh, 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 in, inculturated into indigenous life and did that uh, uh, quietly underground but also uh, dangerously uh, in the face of the opposition of missionaries and, and government authorities and have passed that along to us. It is our desire to carry that work forward and to, to, uh, to be as courageous and compassionate as our elders were um, in, in standing up for that. So here we are uh, uh, today and uh, since, uh, since 1994 and the Covenant, we have sought to be uh, a fellowship of Anglican Christians who recognize the full humanity of indigenous people, of, who recognize the wisdom that 
has been placed in their culture and traditions and ceremonies and who b believe that God was here, that God did not get off the boat with Columbus, that God was here and establishing patterns and ways of life that, as I said, went underground into our hymnals, our catechists, and, and other things. Uh, so we wish to be a church in, in which um, the word is made flesh, uh, is made living and real in indigenous culture, indigenous thought, indigenous ceremony. And that is what we are about today. Um, I think that, um, so what's happening is that we are trying to show uh, respect for uh, the, the, the Anglican Church. We try, are trying to apply the, the basic ideas and, and, and laws of, of, of the of Anglican Christianity, um, which, by the way, generally don't have much to do with a lot of the trappings that come with Anglican Christianity, but we, we try to uh, respond to that. Uh, we try to respond to the heart of Christian faith and to make that make that that word um, become alive uh, in indigenous culture um, we are um, hopeful uh, that that we can see this happen and uh, yeah yeah and you have to understand uh, uh, it's, it's again uh, people tend to look at indigenous people as a well I should say white people tend to look at indigenous people as a primitive expression of what they used to be. And so uh, given enough time and education, uh, you know, out will pop an Englishman. And uh, so uh, the, the, uh, this is, uh, this of course is uh, a beguilement uh, that is quite evil and has led uh, to, to much uh, dangerous and, and difficult mayhem. But um, we, uh, uh, so the borders and boundaries of the Anglican Church of ha Canada, with very few exceptions, are the borders and boundaries of military colonial occupation. And um, I, I said this once to someone who was very supportive of our work, and he said, oh gosh, you know, the, you, you guys have never had colonization, and uh, we, we beg to differ. So, so the 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 the, the uh, uh, we we are trying uh, we are trying to be a, a um, as I said a, an expression of, of the the gospel of, of the, the fundamental principles of Anglican Christianity um, of, 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 of the of indigenous life and respect for those values and that that world we're trying to to do that um and still be an active part of uh the anglican church of canada uh, so uh this this creates challenges but uh it's going to be good and it's going to show a lot of things and uh, as as martin luther king was so clear uh in saying is is um um it's not just uh, oppressed people who will find freedom in this. Uh, people who benefit from oppression, uh, people who have caused oppression, people who, who continue oppression will find great freedom and life in, in this. And uh, so uh, we are, uh, therefore, as I, as I, as I finish, um, we are on this journey, but we are definitely on this journey with uh, Black Anglicans and uh, are delighted to be a part of this, of this, uh, this gathering. And um, that's all for now. <laughs> Thank you, Archbishop MacDonald. Um, you'll have an opportunity to ask Archbishop questions. And I now wish to introduce Reverend Evan Nolden Smith, please. Welcome, Evan. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I am Reverend Evan Smith. I am ordained by the United Church of Canada. 
um, and I've been serving since my ordination at Toronto Urban Native Ministry, so just over six years. Um, I wanted to begin by, um, by sharing part of a document um, because I think it's always important to, uh, to adhere to the wisdom of our elders. And just to give a little bit of a background, um, the United Church of Canada uh, underwent a restructuring uh, a few years ago at our last general council um, where we restructured kind of the whole church. Uh, and as part of that process, uh, there was a, a group of people called the Caretakers of the Indigenous Circle. And this was a group of elders and knowledge keepers um, in our church who were Indigenous. Uh, and they drafted a document. And this was a document that they drafted over the course of three years. It would get drafted, go to community, we would tear it apart. It would get drafted again. Um, and this went on uh, for all three years. Um, and it is a document that outlines what the relationship between the United Church um, and the Indigenous part of the church looks like. And I think it's really important when we are talking about what it looks like to decolonize church um, to acknowledge this, even though uh, it's not necessarily Anglican specific. Um, but I think it's really important because in the United Church, it was uh, one of the I think first times that um, for me and from the history that I know that it really felt like we got to go to the church and say, this is how it's going to be. So it wasn't sort of, you know, like the old school mission um, style of the church telling us what our church was going to look like. This was us going and saying, you know, we're in relationship together. We all bring something to the table. And for us, this is what's important. So I just want to, um, read this is just at the beginning um it's under the heading we will say what indigenous ministry is and it reads british columbia elder alberta billy said we have our own way of doing things other elders have said the same thing especially when there was a conflict with the expectations of the broader western church this is where colonial policies and procedures have worked against the indigenous community our elders have cried out for our own churches leaders training programs and support systems we, the Indigenous Ministries and Communities of Faith of the United Church, declare that we will tell our own story of what ministry means for us. We will decide for ourselves who we are, what constitutes our ministry groups and practices. Colonialism took community control away from us and placed it in a colonial center of authority. Recovery from colonization is our path moving forward. We will determine an Indigenous Tessimer, a training program for ministry preparation, that will help our leaders be competent as the healers and helpers our communities are crying out for. We will recruit and oversee the development of our ministry training students and assist their placement and support in our communities. It also says that we will do Indigenous theology, as well as we will say who we are, because I think the concept of identity is often um, a really difficult one in our communities. And it says the concept of identity is complicated. The very notion of being an Indigenous person is a European construct. Prior to European contact, the people of Turtle Island identified themselves as members of their own tribes, nations, or communities. Intermarriage was common and many children were quote-unquote mixed blood as a result of this, yet accepted in their communities. Many nations have always practiced traditional adoptions, self-determining who is part of their communities. And so I wanted to start with that because I often think of uh, Toronto Urban Native Ministry as uh, church decolonization in action. Um, a large number of the people that we serve come from very different backgrounds. And I would say that the majority of, the, of our community members um, are not simply uh, identifying with one racial identity or racial group. There's also a very present Afro-Indigenous community uh, that is part of Toronto Urban Native Ministries work. And so it's really exciting for me as a minister to be, um, to be invited into this space, to be invited into conversation and relationship uh, with the Black Anglicans 
um, as well as to be able to enter into these spaces um, from a United Church standpoint. I think that uh, our work is really important because we are dealing with a lot of issues that affect uh, both Black communities and Indigenous communities in the city. Uh, we know that uh, sex workers face a lot of violence and often the, um, the people who are receiving that violence are trans women of color. Uh, we do a lot of outreach into the prison system and we know that it's both black and indigenous communities that are overrepresented in our prison systems. Uh, as well, we know that in the LGBT two-spirit communities that we work within, often uh, there is a lot of racism present, um, especially in the Toronto community. My experience within the church has been one that has been complicated, especially when I talk about my attempts to be some sort of ally and friend to, uh, to Black communities within the church. This became apparent for me a couple of years ago when we were undergoing the church restructuring because our funding started to change. And the one thing that I was reassured by was the church's commitment to continue funding Indigenous ministries at the amount uh, that we had received. So our funding got frozen for several years um, and there was a guarantee that it wouldn't go down and that our ministries wouldn't close. I spoke to a colleague uh, who was working at uh, Jane Finch Community Ministry in a predominantly black neighborhood and he expressed to me that he was fearful uh, that he didn't know the future of his outreach ministry if it was going to have to um, become an NGO or not because he couldn't guarantee that the church would fund it. And I realized that for a long time in the church, we have been having a very good and I think productive conversation around um, indigenous uh, settler relations, what that looks like, the legacy of residential schools, um, what reparations look like. And I don't think that that's a conversation, at least in our church context, that we have been having with our black colleagues and members. Um, and the history of the United Church in Black communities. I was co-chair of the uh, Racial Justice and Gender Justice Advisory Committee um, a number of years ago, probably almost 10 years ago, um, which is a committee that doesn't exist anymore in the church, which I think says something. Um, and during my time there, uh, we were trying to implement a mandatory, uh, well, there is a mandatory uh, racial justice training that all of our clergy have to take, um, but it was often very pointed towards, uh, towards white clergy. Um, and those of us who identified as people of color often felt very much on the margins in that and often had to hear um, a lot of uh, racist remarks, et cetera, during it. And I think that uh, as a church, one of our first acts of decolonizing is to ensure that clergy is going in um, with appropriate training around racial justice, around racial inequities in our church. We had an incident at our 43rd General Council where Reverend Paul Waffle from Alberta stood up. Um, he is a black man, stood up and really challenged us um, to listen to the voices of people of color in the church and especially the black community. It was a challenge that was difficult. It started a conversation which paused the middle of our general council and lasted, if I remember correctly, over three and a half hours. Um, it was a space where people of color were invited to come up to the microphones and to share their experience in the church and a lot of them were horrific, and a lot of them were stories that we don't get to hear very often or nearly enough. In an article that Paul had written, uh, he noted that, uh, sorry, uh, that um, most uh, white clergy who had immigrated um, into the United Church, so they had come from uh, European dominant countries uh, and transferred here to be clergy, 
made on average five to 10 applications to seek an initial appointment. However, ministers from predominantly black countries, especially the Caribbean or Africa, had made an on average 30 to 80 applications to seek an initial appointment. Also, many black ministers reported a tendency for people to believe there was a deficiency in their ministerial formation and that they needed to be further trained to do the job of ministry in Canada. I think this is something that we have a lot in common with as Indigenous communities because often our theology is not seen as legitimate, um, our biblical knowledge is not seen as adequate, um, and there are a large number of congregations I know of that would not ever dream of hiring an Indigenous minister. Uh, the United Church made a commitment in 2000 um, under a document that all may be one, and it named four key areas of work to organize for the full participation of all people, organize for diversity by supporting anti-racism work and promoting positive relationships among diverse people, act justly within the church's structures, courts, policies, and practice, and speak to the world by supporting anti-racism work within broader society. I think that we still uh, have a long way to go with that document. I think that we have only just begun the work that has been asked of us. Although I can see change starting to happen, um, Paul made an impact. And I think that, um, well, I know that there is a group of clergy committed to challenging their own uh, anti-black racism, and it's a group made up of white and other people of color um, folks who are starting to try to do that work in the community or continue that work. Um, as well, our General Secretary Nora Saunders has retired as of November 1st, um, and Reverend Michael Blair, a black man, uh, was voted in as the new General Secretary for the church. And I remember Michael saying, uh, when uh, when he was attending my church, I, you know, a, re a revolution's coming, it's coming. Um, and I think that that revival that he was calling for may be starting in the church. So I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm really grateful for, for this relationship. I think it's so important because Toronto Urban Native Ministry has, you know, been in the community. We've been on the ground for almost 23 years now. Um, and I, I think that our ministry can be held up as an example of what decolonized church can begin to look like. And I am excited about where, where the future is going to take us, especially in new relationship and relationship that was long overdue. Miigwech.